my name is Ann Benan, and I am um, part of the Regulatory Compliance Department here at CU Boulder. Um, I'm part of the administrative burden that Kent referred to <laughs> <laughs> earlier, so full disclosure. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not an attorney, uh, but we do work closely with them, and we try to be the conduit between the attorneys and the researchers to kind of facilitate this process as much as we can. So hopefully, um, you know, you can speak with Bob and all the other researchers that they can vouch for me, but I won't listen to the comments. Um, so anyways, today um, I just wanted to cover what we are allowed to do on the CU Boulder campus. Um, Duane talked about uh, how the Federal Farm Bill and the Colorado Hemp Act um, mesh together or don't mesh and so I don't really want to go into that too much but um, I, there is a lot of uncertainty with regard to industrial hemp research not only how it is defined as in this amendment X versus the federal definition but <clears throat> what does it really allow researchers to do on campus um, then I also am going to go into the details of how we have facilitated researchers like Bob and Ema and Mike and Daniela, um, Kent, to do their research on campus in the murky waters of the federal and Colorado legislation. Um, and then what does our future look like? Um, do we have hope? All right. All right. Um, so <clears throat> the research um, that you know, we're allowed to do is <clears throat> it's about, you know, they would love for us to not touch it ever at all. So they would like it to be about cannabis, but don't touch it. Um, <laughs> and the other option is you can get a DEA license so that you can touch it. But the hurdles, as Dr. Leahy went into excruciating detail, was 22 months from start to, or uh, from start of the process to actually start of the research is painful. Um, and then the other part where we have <laughs> developed a process for our researchers on campus is to go the industrial hemp route, um, working closely with Duane, who, as Bob touted, is fabulous. And so he's really um, been instrumental in getting our research off the ground. Um, we are registered with the uh, CDA. We have two licenses, one for this building, uh, actually the laboratory space next door, and then uh, a bunch of greenhouses on campus as well. Um, so the uncertainty related to the hemp um, is, you know, the federal farm bill really only talks about growing or cultivating the hemp. It doesn't do, tell you what you can do with it after. So it does say industrial uh, or higher education institutes of higher education can do research on it, but what does that really mean? Um, does it mean that we can just cultivate it and then throw it down the tube? Or can we, um, do we have to cultivate it? Are we really allowed to obtain it from other sources and then bring that onto campus? Um, these are all things that we kind of struggled with from 2014, which predated my arrival at the university. Um, to, you know, full participation at this point. I'm going to take a drink because my, I'm getting over a cold. <laughs> so part of the problem is that we struggle with the definition of industrial hemp. So as, it, as Dwayne went into um, during his talk, it was defined, we defined it in our constitution, and then it was federally defined, and they're very similar. Um, and then in its infinite wisdom, they, um, the policymakers uh, uh, on the federal level got together and decided they needed clarifications on the hemp. So they added that uh, industrial hemp is used exclusively um, for industrial purposes such as fiber and seed, which added no clarification and actually kind of freaked people out more because then you think, oh, I'm only allowed to do it um, for industrial purposes and not for medical purposes or any of the other uh, it, ways that you can use it. Um, all right, so, so, so 
our industrial hemp derived materials ex um, excluded from Schedule 1? No, according to the DEA and the FDA. However, with the state pilot programs, and as Ed and Rich went into, that you can extract tons of different things from these materials, and they're very useful, and we're just determining what they do. So as a university, a lot of our money is coming from the feds. So we cannot risk um, being dinged on the federal you know, NIH, yanking funds from the entire university because of one rogue researcher or whatever. So <laughs> Bob has, is our, our designee for that. <laughs> He'll take the fall. <laughs> Um, anyway, so we, you know, we struggled for a very long time of how, what do we feel comfortable with implementing in, on our campus? And we want to protect ourselves as a university, we want to protect the researchers as well. Um, so one thing that's positive and that helps us sleep at night is that they actually have been defunding any prosecution of, of these industrial um, hemp um, states that have enacted their own policies. So, and just recently, the 2018 Consolidated Appropriations Act prevents the Department of Justice and DEA from providing any funds for the prosecution or, or, and use of industrial hemp. So that's a pretty big blanket use. So we're, we feel pretty good. Um, so, what do, we, what do we do on the Boulder campus to help these researchers get their hands on the material that is derived from industrial hemp? So we can either, you know, they are fully within their bounds to get a DEA Schedule One license, and many have applied, and only uh, Kent did have one years ago, which he said he abandoned because the crap from NIDA was crap. Um, <laughs> so. Um, or they could um, get it from industrial hemp. And so it can either be um, manufactured uh, elsewhere and shipped in, or the researchers can grow it themselves on campus. And Bob has done just that. Uh, sorry. So for human subjects, we are not like Anschutz Medical Campus that has um, you know, obviously human studies and they need to have it FDA, DEA, IRB approval, NIH. So there's all these parties in their hands with your material. Um, but we've found a different route um, for human observational studies, which Kent went into in his talk, that um, the use of the marijuana and is it's not done on campus. It's not provided by the researchers. You can't recruit CU students or employees. Um, so there's different hurdles that Kent and Cinnamon and many other researchers that have abided by this, and it's been quite successful. And then they can actually use what people use on in the market, people that go to the dispensaries. It's not this 3% THC product that you get from NIDA that was manufactured three years ago, and who knows if their C of A still applies. <laughs> um, all right, so then we can also do research involving uh, animal studies. So there's several researchers that have gone this route. You can still obtain your DEA Schedule One license. You can grow it yourself and feed it to the animals, or you can, um, collaborate with an outside entity that wants to provide you with, sorry, <laughs> that wants to provide you with the um, purified substance. So Bob is one of our um, providers as his um, entity is Seavers Infinity or Seavers Biotech, um, or they can collaborate with anyone. And we just have three criteria that they must meet. They must be registered with the CDA um, to have a license. They must have a federally insured bank account and they must certify that they do not work with the marijuana industry. So, well, what is that? What is the marijuana industry? Um, so we have defined it very loosely as a direct beneficial owner of a retail marijuana or a medical marijuana establishment as it's defined 
in our <coughs> act, and or a commercial grower, processor, distributor, or seller of marijuana. So we don't consider things like a soil company that provides, um, you know, the microbiologically intact soil to be one of those people uh, or light lighting people. Um, so anyway, so when you when we go through this process of finding these suppliers, um, I have the utmost trust of Dr. Sievers here, but the process that we go through to vet these suppliers are to verify the registration. So, and that's difficult to do, because if you have a company that is just the, um, uh, you know, taking the white label, putting their own label on, they don't always tell you where that came from. And you don't know for sure, but we, we have to trust them. Um, we make them provide material safety data sheets, um, analytical testing results for um, identification and purity and contaminants, um, similar to Ed described. And if it's going to be used in an IACUC regulated study, um, it has to be certified to be, um, it's a non-pharmaceutical grade material going into these animals. So we don't want to put something in them that has heavy metals or things that, because of the cultivation process, things that they never even tested. So we make sure that they can provide some of these items if it is going into animals. So our process is to have, um, uh, so I think I'm the only one with slides, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, okay. So, so that's okay. Um, so our, this is what our um, MTA material transfer agreement looks like. So we have one of these with Bob and he has provided material to many researchers across campus um, because he's gone through the vetting process. He complies with all of our requirements. Um, so who is your supplier? If they are registered with the CDA to cultivate the hemp. Sometimes they might be registered with the CDA to cultivate it and they process and purify it. And sometimes they don't cultivate it at all and they are just the purification um, of it. So the thing is, you can purify this stuff in your garage if you wanted to. So um, we go through a little bit higher standards if it's going into iCook regulated study and the funny thing about CBD products are they are not regulated anywhere close to what the MED, the Marijuana Enforcement Division, uh, regulates marijuana products that are sold in your dispensary. So you can go to Amazon and buy God knows what. <laughs> and, um, and that's okay, but you, you can't do that in, in the Colorado dispensary. So that's why we really want to be careful when we vet these people. And, you know, we we say that we have the option to audit you, but that has not yet been necessary. I don't know that I want to. Um, all right. So who can pay for the research? Not the marijuana industry, as we know. So um, the Cole memo says that any, anyone that knowingly facilitates activities related to the marijuana industry um, could be prosecuted. But we... Um, so that's why we don't do it. But who can pay for it? So the, the a government, the government entity, the Small Business Association, just in April said that they will not even work with uh, hemp companies, um, and they only include hemp, legitimate hemp pro proper, um, products as paper, clothing, and rope. So it really puts researchers at a bind to get how to how to pay for this. So there is, um, there is a provision in the Colorado Hemp Act that allows up to 10 million of funding from the marijuana tax cash fund. So that would be from them, but it would be routed <laughs> through the CDA, and that has never come our way. Um, but Duane can speak more to that. Um, but anyways, <laughs> then and related to that, the. Um, Senate enacted a bill that they want to set up a task force for industrial hemp authority to try to spend that money. Um, we have 
concerns about that, uh, mostly Duane does because it's his department that really has to review all the proposals. But they have had since August 9th and they have until December 31st to do a report to determine if they even need that in addition to what is already in um, house with Duane's department. Um, and I'd, I'd like you to speak more to that if you could um, later if people have questions because uh, it's my knowledge no one has met yet. Correct. <laughs> yes. Okay. You haven't so, missed anything. Right. <laughs> Kent is, on the, is our designee from the campus and we now have two months left so who knows. Um, so what does the future hold for us? So as, as uh, Duane was mentioning, uh, there are efforts to redefine industrial hemp. And there's also the very scary prospect of GW Pharma, big pharma stamping their foot onto all these little CBD companies that are, um, you know, making a killing. Um, so <laughs> the impact of GW's pharma is or that any non-FDA approved CBD extract remains a Schedule I, which the DEA was very adamant in making that statement when they rescheduled Epidiolex only on September 28th to be Schedule V. But if you read the uh, House Bill 181295 that was adopted in May, it prohibits an entity with FDA approval or its agent to initiate criminal, civil, or administrative proceedings to prevent non-pharmaceutical production of cannabinoids. I say that was a lot of foresight <laughs> before um, Epidiolex was even um, officially approved, even though everyone knew it was going to be. So um, Duane went into what the future is for redefining industrial hemp and whether we should um, adopt Amendment X, gets strikes out the THC and then just says it's either federal or state statute. So, um, so what does the future hold? This was very encouraging because the DEA, when they released their statement of rescheduling Epidiolex, they said they are committed to continuing to work with our federal partners to seek ways to make the process more efficient and effective like the DA has always operated. <laughs> Sorry, that's it. All right, thank you. <laughs>